views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Marijuana. It's a hot-button social and political topic, and as the state of New York works to make weed legal, there's a vibrant debate in all corners of state politics. Some want the law to address racial disparities in policing the drug. They want to address disproportionate incarceration rates amongst black and Latino communities. Others are concerned about the largely under-researched health repercussions from frequent marijuana use. Still others are concerned their kids will get their hands on weed like young people got their hands on e-cigarettes. Hi, I'm Teresa Schle a reporter with NPR affiliate WFUV News, located on the Rose Hill campus of Fordham University here in the Bronx. Hi, I'm Julia Rist. I'm a reporter with WFUV News. We're pleased to be partnering with BronxNet Television to bring you Bronx Connections, Impact of Legal Weed, our panel on marijuana legalization and what it can mean for the borough. With us today to discuss this topic is Eli Northrup. He's Associate Special Counsel with Bronx Defenders, a holistic criminal defense center in the South Bronx. Joseph Thompson is on Bronx Community Board 11 and the 49th Precinct Community Council. Thank you all for being with us. Now, to both of you, what was your first reaction when Governor Cuomo made his announcement to the plan to legalize recreational marijuana? Thank you for, for having me on, on the show and for the opportunity to speak about this important issue. Um, I think the first reaction from, from our perspective um, at the Bronx Defenders was it's nice that uh, the governor is coming to realize what we've known for a long time, which is that um, while it's pretty widely acknowledged that marijuana usage is even amongst all people in New York City, only certain people were being targeted for enforcement of that. And that's unacceptable. Um, so we're encouraged by the effort to legalize marijuana. But in order to do it correctly, um, it needs to be restorative. And I think the governor's proposal actually really doesn't go far enough in some key ways in terms of um, sealing and expunging past convictions, in terms of making sure that the money raised from the marijuana, the new economy in marijuana, goes back into the communities that have really been affected and have been targeted for enforcement. Um, and also in making sure that there's going to be opportunities for people in those communities to benefit from this new economy that's going to be created. So uh, while we're encouraged by the governor's proposal, it has some flaws. And I think that um, the bills in the legislature uh, actually are stronger bills and something that we support more fully. And what was your reaction? Well, I had a little problem with it. And uh, let me just mention my background. I am a retired uh, New York City police detective. I hope that doesn't taint my testimony here tonight. But uh, one of the things that bothered me is every time we, we mention marijuana, we marry that with, uh, with discrimination and uh, a change from different people to different things. One of the things that bothers me mostly about this is because people have to realize that there are certain areas, and unfortunately they are black and Hispanic areas, that uh, they have a lot of crime. They have gangs, they have street crimes. They have problems like that. And throughout history, we've done the same thing. Uh, whenever there's a, a situation like that, when there's a lot of crime, there's deaths and gangs, um, the police department does send the majority of their forces to those areas. I mean, we can go back all the way. You can take the, uh, uh, the Irish gangs in Five Points. Well, when they were having Irish gangs in Five Points, the police went to Five Points. Um, on the Lower East Side, when we had uh, Murder Incorporated in the Jewish area, the police department went to the Jewish area. We had the Mafia, of course, the Black Hand, we went to the Italian areas. We had drugs and, and, uh, and shootings in Harlem. We went to the black area. So the police department has met so many people. And the police department actually is 7,000 members less than, uh, than in the 60s. 
and with more duties to perform. So what they try to do is concentrate on those areas where people are getting robbed, they're getting killed, there's gang wars, there's machete hackings. So they're gonna send their forces there. They're gonna send 300 people to Bed-Stuy, but you only need 20 people in Riverdale or Forest Hills. So if you send 300 people to an area that's problematic and it's a dangerous area, Number one, the police are much more aware of what's surrounding them. They're much more aware. And um, you're gonna, they're going to look for everything. They're going to look for crime. And you've got 300 eyes looking and 300 people looking uh, for crime. In Riverdale, you've got 20 people looking for crime. And fortunately, they don't have gang problems. So they don't have killings in the streets. So the police department will send these people to where it's needed. My bother, what bothers me is that uh, they marry. Every time I hear about legalizing marijuana, it's always being married uh, with racial uh, disparities. So I have a question. If usage rates are pretty much roughly the same across all races, do you think it's important that the criminal justice system address that disparity, or do you think it's not important? It's important. Uh, I'm not sure it's strictly uh, the criminal justice system, but it's the way we, we, we go about doing it. And um, what we've done is taking, is taking people out of, out of the crime area and saying, we're going to legalize this because there's a disparity in race. And I think that's a bad excuse. And I just told you why. Because the police will send officers to, to areas that are necessary. Uh, and they're going to see more. And they're going to arrest more. And that's normal. If I could just respond, I think, one, um, imagine how much more effective those officers could be if they didn't have to spend any time making low-level marijuana arrests. I mean, that could free them up to actually focus on things that are more serious. And we've seen, actually, a huge drop in arrests, yet the racial disparity still persists. So um, even when they're not concentrating on, on marijuana, I mean, as recently as 2011, there was 50,000 arrests. So they were concentrating on this. They've stopped concentrating largely on marijuana arrests. It's NYPD policy. Mm -hmm. And they've gone down, but crime has not gone up. So it wasn't an effective way of policing, it seems like, number one. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's not just the number of arrests, it's the outcomes people get, too. Mm -hmm. So while there's a huge racial disparity in arrests, when a white person was arrested for marijuana, they were 50% more likely to get an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, which is basically like a dismissal of the case, rather than somebody who's black or Latino. So it wasn't just the arrests, it's also what happens after somebody gets arrested. And so... Um, the, just the, the numbers of police in a certain area can't explain all of it. I think there's some, well, I know that there's racism embedded in the criminal justice system. Now, I think that's why when people are starting to realize that only certain neighborhoods, even the neighborhoods that are um, largely white, the majority of people arrested for marijuana in those neighborhoods are minorities. So it's not just that they can, they're in these certain neighborhoods. It's when they're in white neighborhoods, they're arresting non-white people. Um, now, is that alone a good reason to not enforce the law? Well, in this case, yes. Because I think of the studies done that show that marijuana is not a, a danger to society in the way that a lot of other things are. Um, so that's just what I wanted to, to say on that. Well, I agree with that. I can agree with most of it anyway. And, um, but marijuana, unfortunately, leads into other things. And uh, those other things, um, if you have a glass of wine and you do that for a year and you get a certain warm feeling with that glass of wine, well, after a year, well, you stop getting a warm feeling with a glass of wine. So you have two glasses of wine. And the next thing you know, you get a bottle of wine. It's the same thing with drugs. Drugs will, you will use a drug 
until that drug no longer uh, does anything for you. Give you that uh, that feeling, that euphoric feeling, or that feeling of power, and then you need something stronger. I work with a lot of uh, drug addicts. Uh, I was in plain clothes, the Vice Squad for a while, and I had uh, I had uh, drug users, heroin users, as informants, and I've heard their stories. I've heard where they where they came from, where they started. Uh, we had a good relationship with most of the people that, that actually worked for me. Um, and it's always been the same. It's always a progressive thing. Now, I can, I can agree uh, definitely with the disparity in, in the justice system. Paul Manafort got four years, and <laughs> he should have gotten ten. So, yeah, there's a problem there, and it's always been a problem there. Uh, I think we also have to remember we have to take consideration um, a person's record. And if we're looking at a first-time offender as opposed to a five-time offender, then we have to meet out justice uh, the way it comes out that way. So, yeah, I think our biggest problem is in the wording and what he proposes, and he's going to make it 18 or only adults can buy it and things like that. And that, that I definitely agree with, that the crime is in and they're making this thing work. And so far I haven't heard anybody say what really has to be said about making it work. Um, you're going to make it uh, so that a 21-year-old can buy it. Well, 15-year-old kids are smoking cigarettes, and they're drinking booze. And where do they get it from? They'll get the marijuana the same way they get the cigarettes and, and the booze. So there has to be a lot of th the thought that goes into how we put this together. Uh, decriminalizing it, um, I like that. And I like it to be right across the board. But the way we put it together is going to make a big difference here. And I think a uh, point that Joe makes clearly is addiction is a real thing. Yeah. And, and a lot of people suffer from it. And I think um, peop we're starting to become more aware of that. I guess one question I have is whether the criminal justice system, the criminal legal system, is the appropriate way to deal with people who are addicted to drugs. Or, or whether there's a better way to deal with it, which is focus on the health, the medical effects. It's like public, more of a public health issue than a criminal issue. Because from people I've seen that have served time incarcerated for drug offenses, it doesn't necessarily help them on the way out. But I think we all acknowledge that you know, addiction is real. Um, now, the level that marijuana has been found to be less addictive than many other drugs, but you know, and, and you know, alcohol clearly is legal. Maybe if it were regulated and treated in a different way, we could actually help prevent addiction and, and educate people more and steer them toward the path to, to recovery. Joe, do you have a response to that? I couldn't agree more. First, first of all, I had uh, an informant that was very close to me. Uh, I got to know him, very intelligent. He was just a heroin addict. Now, I spoke to him. He wanted to quit. He asked to quit. So I called up several places trying to place him. And the answer I got was, well, we may have some room in six months. This is a drug addict. He wants to do it, and he wants to do it now. Right. So you don't have a bed for him. So you don't have those pieces in place. Putting him in jail, that's the cheapest way we could do it. Uh, causes less of a problem for, for the court system. But yeah, but yeah. doing it uh, the proper way is going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. But that's the way it should be done. And people like uh, my, my guy, uh, he wanted to quit. Oh, incidentally, that was 40 years ago. And I want you to know something. I saw him not too long ago. And uh, he quit. That's very interesting. <laughs> we're well, he going had a to wife that stayed with him. Yes, yeah. we're going to actually take a quick break now, but we'll be back to that after these short messages, and we'll continue our discussion on recreational marijuana.
let's continue our discussion on the legalization of recreational marijuana. We're now joined by State Senator Jamal Bailey. Senator Bailey is the chairman of the State Senate's Committee on Codes. Senator, what's the current state of recreational marijuana legalization in the state legislature? So there, uh, one, thank you for having me on today yeah. with these uh, incredible panelists Thanks today. For and, and I'm just excited to be able to speak about something that's uh, of an incredible importance to our community. So you have, it's, it's in the governor's budget, in, but it's also been introduced as a standalone bill by Senator Liz Kruger and uh, Assembly Member, Majority Leader, excuse me, Crystal People Stokes in the Assembly. And there are some distinctions between between the bill in terms of um, in terms of what that where, the, where the revenue would go, as as Mr. Northrop mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the legislature, our goal we want to make sure that there is expungement, and, and uh, of of the offenses because we want to make sure that if we're legalizing cannabis, and if we're going to make sure that we 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 kind of um, clear clear the path, so to speak, we have to make sure that those individuals in the most affected communities have a path not just towards clearing their records, but a path towards actual ownership, um, a path towards being able to be a part of the system that has failed them in so, so many communities. Depending on where you go, marijuana is effectively legal in certain places throughout the city of New York and the city of New York, uh, and, 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 and I say that tongue-in-cheek, but it, the enforcement in certain communities, black and brown communities, is much more severe. It's hyper-targeted, it's hyper-located. As opposed, as opposed to other communities. So what we're trying to do in the legislature is create legalization so that we can have a clear playing field across the board, increase revenues, putting revenues back in the communities that have been affected, um, also dissipating the black market um, so that we can have safer communities. And, 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 but one of the things that we're making sure that we look at are actual realistic effects, such as traffic. Right? Uh, so I believe in Colorado and other states that have legalized it, they've had incidences of traffic matters that have gone up. Uh, we've Senator Kruger, who is the who is the champion of this in the Senate, she she has been speaking to individuals to ensure that we're trying to hire more individuals if this gets passed, if and when it gets passed, to ensure that traffic safety is something that is of the mo uh, that is of the most paramount of, of, of importance. And we we don't want to rush into doing something just for the sake of saying that hey, New Jersey's doing it, we need to hurry up and do it. As New York State, we're the Empire State, we lead on things, and we're going to do it right. Take a take take a steps, take deliberative steps to make sure we get it done. And Governor Cuomo has recently made comments about that recreational marijuana will not be passed with this coming budget. So what would you say is stopping it from being passed? Well, I mean, there are, there are a lot of different factors, and the, the governor ha, ha, has mentioned that, but we have a, a, quite a few days to go until April 1st. And, you know, and, and as you may know, in Albany, anything can happen, and, 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 I, and I wouldn't say the door's closed on that. Um, we, we continue to have conversations about what we can get done and get done right in the state, in the state budget. Um, you know, there uh, obviously there are people who are who are not exactly excited about the legalization of, of marijuana, and we have a large state to worry about and certain constituencies to 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 understand and take the temperature and the pulse of. But in my opinion, as uh, as the chairman of the codes committee and, and as somebody who is um, really involved in the criminal justice system and, and the adverse in, impact that uh, drug or cannabinoid cannabis that has had on communities of color, I, I believe that it's time that we legalize it. Even though I've never tried it in my life, don't intend to. Never will. But it's not about me or my personal use. It's about what's right for our communities and, and how they've been over-policed, over-affected, and actually under, under-represented in, in, the, in the process. Why do you see the legalization of recreational marijuana to be a race issue? Can you elaborate on that? Well, it, it's, it's partly a race issue, it, just because of unequal enforcement of marijuana, of marijuana arrests. If you, if you look at statistics, will show that black and brown people, by and large, are arrested more for possession of marijuana. And, he, and if you're looking at studies, in it, formal or informal, marijuana is consumed by people of all different races across the board. So, so why is it that people of color are being arrested for it more? That's, that's, that's a major question that, that you have to answer. But the reality is that legalization is not solely based upon race. It would help people in communities of color, without a doubt, um, especially if we get to reinvest the revenue from marijuana legalization in communities. Uh, worker-owned businesses, worker cooperatives, something I'm a huge proponent of. If we can have a worker cooperative, a worker-owner aspect of the marijuana legalization, that would affect, that would, that would pro positively affect communities of color in, in so many different ways, not just in terms of legalization, legalization for recreational use, but for economic benefits that, you, that would continue to reap themselves over the course of time. And what are some of the concerns that have been raised by senators that you hear in Albany? Well, it's not just senators; it's members of assembly. It's 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 a lot of people who have concerns. They're they're concerned about the issues of being of it being a gateway drug, of it of traffic safety, uh, of 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 the public nuisance um, matter. Uh, folks are concerned about the smell and, and other quality of life issues. But 
in, in the legislature, we have to um, always undergo a delicate balancing act in terms of what we personally don't do or want to do versus what is good for society at large. And, and, and that this is a personal decision that I believe that this is good for society at large, the state at large, I should say. So a number of counties have recently announced that, or municipalities have announced that they are going to opt out of Governor Cuomo's proposal. Do you think that undermines the credibility of this bill at all? I wouldn't say undermines the credibility, but, but I believe that we, we have to make sure we have equal enforcement ability throughout the state of New York. If we have 62 counties, and if, if you're going from um, uh, Kings County to Queens County and one county is opted out, we, we, have, issues concern, we, have, issues, uh, we have issues and concerns about, like, are you, are, you committing some, are you committing a crime because you're going across the borough lines and if it's if Nassau opts out or Suffolk opts out or Chautauqua County opts out wh what what issues do we have with that so like I, I like uniform policies across the board the penal law is the penal law in 62 counties in the state of New York I believe that marijuana should be if, if we if we are to legalize it it should be legal in 62 counties across the state of, state of New York I don't I don't want to interfere in any other people's in counties but I think that equal enforcement is important Joe, from a law enforcement uh, perspective, do you have anything to say about any problems that can arise from some counties opting out, some counties staying in this proposal? Well, there's no doubt about it. The senator made a, an excellent point because we can't, we can't have, uh, uh, we can't, we have to be able to go across lines as, as far as New York State is concerned. Um, we all drive, we all visit, we all have family in different places. Um, recreational. That's the term that sort of bothers me a little bit here. Uh, what exactly is the difference between recreational drug use and non-recreational drug use? Is there a difference? I mean, I, I think it softens, it softens uh, legalizing marijuana if you say recreational, but I don't see the difference. I see a difference in uh, who sells it, who profits by it, uh, but I don't see a difference in, by saying recreational, it softens uh, the, stand, uh, the stance on that. And what are some of the concerns that you've been hearing from the community board or residents in your neighborhood? Well, I think the senator uh, noted most of them. Uh, it's if you live in an apartment house and you have somebody smoking a cigar, and I think we all have. I don't smoke cigars. But to smell marijuana, to have people come to your house and have the hallways filled with marijuana smoke, then that's a problem for us. Uh, because people will think, well, I'm, I'm walking into a drug den. And marijuana is sort of like a cigar. The smoke is unmistakable. It's very, very strong and people know what it is. So uh, that's one of the issues that we have. The second issue, of course, is always the fact that uh, you're not quite yourself when you're smoking marijuana. You get a little braver, a little bolder, you drive a little faster, and that's a concern. My biggest uh, problem with legalizing marijuana, though, is what it leads to, and what it can lead to, I should say. And to me, it, it leads to uh, an increase in either marijuana or different drugs. And that's not good. If I if could just uh, respond to a couple of the things. I think so for, from some recent studies that have been conducted, because obviously people are very interested in the outcomes in other states where marijuana has been legalized. Um, I, I actually don't think that there's been an increase in traffic accidents in Washington or in Colorado based on marijuana usage. I think the data is unclear that that's actually occurred. Um, there has not been an increase in crime after marijuana was legalized. It does not seem that there's been an increase in youth usage of marijuana. In some ways, regulating it actually has positive effects. Also, there was a recent study um, done that showed that the effect of marijuana on driving is more like talking on the phone while you're driving than driving drunk. It's, it's more like driving while distracted than while driving drunk. Not to say that it should be condoned, but it's not at the same level of danger as driving while drunk. And I think we also have to acknowledge that people are smoking marijuana right now. People are smoking in apartment buildings. People are smoking and driving. It's, 
it's something that's being used because a large majority of the public supports its usage. So what's the best way as a society to want to deal with a substance like that? Um, is it to penalize people? And some of these penalties are actually severe. And I think just to talk about the other, the other side of things, we have clients that we see in the Bronx, clients who um, may not be citizens but are legal permanent residents who have lived in the Bronx for 20 years, who have a marijuana conviction from 15 years ago for possessing one, one joint. They go to visit their family in Portugal. They come back to the airport. They're detained, and they're put in ICE custody and they're put in deportation proceedings. Is this an even, do, do we think that that's fair? Or that that's an appropriate punishment? So the other side of the legalization uh, debate is that it's actually doing a lot of harm. I mean, there's certain, in family court, for example, family court judges will deny a family member being able to take care of children because they have a prior marijuana conviction. And those children may go into foster care instead of staying with a family member. People are denied housing. I have a client who was denied housing because of one marijuana conviction. Um, so it's having, and people can't get student loans. So, you know, these, these arrests over, and these racially disparate arrests, which have been focused in many communities in the Bronx, um, four of the neighborhoods with the top rates of marijuana arrests are in the Bronx. They're really having an effect on people. And I, and I think we have to balance that really negative effect that's happening right now with the potential drawbacks of legalization and, and see where we come out. And I think it's clear from, from my perspective, from our perspective, that legalization and restorative, and, and restorative legalization to make people whole, as the senator talked about, is really the way, f the way forward. And for Joe, from your perspective, what hurts the Bronx more? Legal weed or illegal weed? Well, they, they both smell the same. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, people are going to use marijuana. That's a, that's a fact of life. It's just like people are going to drink, people are going to smoke cigarettes. My wife hates it, but yeah. Um, what bothers people more? I think it bothers them about the same as far as whether it's legal or illegal. But what I, what bothers me is, and we were just talking, Eli and I were talking before this, and he mentioned the precincts in the Bronx with the highest arrest records. Incidentally, I do agree with him on the immigration and, and these petty little things that are keeping people out of our country. And, uh, and, and that's, that's for sure because that's what they're trying to do for these sort of nonsense things. Um, but uh, as, as far as the drug itself is concerned, we don't have the pieces in place to even have this conversation because it's not just the drug itself. It's how do we, how do we monitor it? How do we make sure? There's no way of making sure that a 15-year-old cannot get it. There's no way, because 15-year-olds get cigarettes. They get, they get alcohol. So there's no way of making sure of that. If it's out there, they'll get it. Now, there's a couple of things that happen. So when you grow up and when you're, you're, you're a child, the senator mentioned it. Um, he never smoked marijuana. I personally never smoked it. I had to smell it because I had to make a rest for it. So I had to know what it smelled like. But... Um, what do we learn? What do we, where do we get our rules from to live by? We get them from our families. We get them from our places of worship. We get it from our educators. And we get them from the police department. If you go past this line, then you're going to bring the police into this. So we, we, we adopt these rules. Now, we've, we've changed our minds many, many times about laws Prohibition, for example, when they said, okay, let's, let's, let's stop drinking. Well, nobody stopped drinking. They just started shooting people. So that didn't work. We don't want to kind of do that, especially with something like marijuana. But we have to have the pieces in place. If we're going to do this and if we're going to 
pass this law, then we have to have the pieces in place before we pass the law. And we have to take a quick break now, but stay with us as we continue our discussion on the impact of legal weed. Welcome back to Bronx Connections. Let's continue our discussion on the legalization of recreational marijuana. Joining us now is Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, a doctor of internal medicine with Montefiore Health System. So, Senator, back to you about uh, Governor Cuomo's proposed bill. Do you think this bill adequately addresses both the racial disparities that we've been talking about, but also the public health concerns? It is a step in the right direction. I, I believe that, again, as, jo as Mr. Thompson mentioned, Anytime you're, you're, you're making a groundbreaking, uh, a huge step forward towards the legalization of something that has not been legal in this state or in this country, still isn't federally legal, right? But we, there are going to be some, 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 some bumps along the road. Uh, I think the governor is well-intentioned in terms of what his legislation does. Uh, I think that Senator Kruger's bill goes a little bit further in terms of what it can do, how, how, how we can get, the, get resources to the affected communities. But the governor does address um, affected communities, and again, from my personal perspective, I'd like it even to go even further. We, 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 we need to make sure that individuals who have been most affected, that they are not only just consumers of this, that they are owners and they are able to, to build in communities that have been destroyed by this quote-unquote war on drugs. And for years and years we had this, quote, this war on drugs where black and brown people were criminalized instead of being treated like the public health crisis that it, that it is, whether it is heroin, cocaine, or marijuana, Drug addicts were considered to be dope fiends and junkies as opposed to individuals who need medical attention. Now we're changing things and, and, and we have the opioid crisis which is finally drawing attention to communities of color that, again, we've had crisis here for years, but is drawing attention to, the, to these things now. And, I, and I'm glad that we're finally doing some things around that. And just to, just to plug another bill I have, uh, medicated assisted treatment in prisons, right? Individuals who are incarcerated, we need to make sure that they have access to medication while they're in prison so that after they come out, if the, if the goal of, of incarceration is to re truly re rehabilitate people, we have to make sure that people are going to be able to come back to communities and be a part of the communities that they left during this, this, this failed war on drugs. And to Dr. Cunningham, what's the medical community's perspective on marijuana? 
Right, so um, that's a great question. And I would start by saying the problem is we don't know enough information. So that's the first problem. And, and part of the reason why is because it's still illegal at the federal level. And the federal dollars are really what fund most of the research in this country. So um, you know, we need to be able to do the research. And in order to do that, um, there have to be changes at the federal level. And then once we can do the re adequate research, then we can know how, if, and whom uh, medical marijuana should be used. So, you know, it's very interesting where um, states are sort of moving ahead, um, but really without the research to guide it, um, and the research is really far behind. Um, but we at Montefiore and Einstein, we have, we have research happening right now um, looking at patients who have pain, who are taking opioids, and who start medical marijuana, and looking to see what happens to their opioids. So we believe that their opioid use will actually go down, and potentially their harms will be reduced, but their pain will still be appropriately managed. So that study is ongoing, and because science is so slow, I'll have an answer in about three years from now. <laughs> so do you see any health concerns behind the legalization of recreational marijuana, anything involving the smoke or prolonged use with the research we're working with right now? Right, well, what we do know from research is clearly about marijuana use in youth, um, and so we know that there, it can be harmful in terms of cognitive effects, and um, also risk of um, developing an addiction to cannabis. So, um, you know, so it's really important that as, as the legislation, you know, moves forward that youth are protected, that there's a lot of education um, around that. You know, it's, it's not really any different for tobacco or for alcohol. It's really the same kinds of considerations. But that is one, one thing that it's, it's clear among youth, the potential harms. Among other groups of adults, um, you know, again, we, we really don't know. Um, we don't really know the benefits and the harms that are associated with, with use. What we do know is that people are dying of opioids every single day in this country and every single day in the Bronx, um, and people don't die of a, of a marijuana overdose. So I think we have to look at, you know, the relative risks and benefits compared to what's out in the world today. So is the medical community looking to marijuana as a potential solution to the opioid crisis? Is that what you're sort of getting at? Well, the opioid crisis is complex, right? And so when there's complex problems, it requires complex solutions. Um, I don't think there's anybody who would tell you that there's one single silver bullet. Uh, you know, so there's many different things that have to happen. Um, could this be one piece? Possibly. Um, I, you know, I want to say, though, I want to make a very clear distinction. So we know that marijuana reduces pain. And there have been many studies that have shown that. Um, but now, and so potentially that can reduce opioids for, because people are taking opioids for pain. Mm -hmm. But people who have an opioid addiction are a bit different. And we have good treatment for opioid addiction in this country. We don't need to look to marijuana for that because we have three medications that work, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. The problem is, is the people who need the treatment aren't getting the treatment. So the problem is the way that we're delivering care, not necessarily that we have to look for another kind of medical treatment. So for opioid addiction, the, the, really the solution is getting people the treatment that they need that already exists. For pain, though, that's where I think marijuana could have an impact to prevent um, um, people from um, getting addicted to opioids. And for Eli, there are some people who may say that marijuana is a gateway drug, including Governor Cuomo up until 2018. What would you say to some a person who would say that? Right. Well, I'm, I'm not a doctor, um, but I, I don't know that um, I don't know the research that the research bears that out from speaking with uh, other people in the coalition that, that uh, the Bronx Defenders are part of in terms of looking to legalize marijuana. I, it seems like um, there's research that shows many people have, it's a, it's a terminus drug in terms of people getting, using marijuana and staying with marijuana instead of progressing to more serious drugs. I think that the research s may support that. Um, I, and I, I just want to say medical marijuana is legal in New York State. We've already yeah. crossed that bridge, and, and mm -hmm. that was, you know, that, that had to go through the legislative process, and we decided that it was a good thing for the state to have. Um, I, I do think there is a sense of urgency. I think we're not really feeling the urgency. We want to get it right. Everybody wants to get it right. 
But there is a sense of urgency because every day, still, in the Bronx, our clients are affected by the marijuana laws. Every day. Mothers in family court, people in immigration detention proceedings, people being arrested for marijuana yesterday. So there is an urgency, and I think we now know that only certain people are getting arrested. It's even, the, the disparity is even worse in the Bronx. Our clients, 95% black or Hispanic, and mostly men. So despite the fact that, as we've already spoken about, the usage rates are, are even, certain people are being targeted, I think we need to, to realize that there is an urgency to get this done. Two years from now, that's a lot of people being deported in the current political administration for this. So I hope that you know, the governor, there's not politics being played that, puts, that pushes this off. It seems like the legislature is united behind a bill and is pushing a really strong bill that does a lot to restore people. And I'm really hopeful that this can get done. And I hope that people who care about it will reach out to their legislators, reach out to the governor, and say, we need this now. Because you know, if it gets pushed off, who knows if it will happen in a legislative session. I think it's much harder to pass then. Who knows it will happen next year, which is an election year. And you're looking at a lot of people who are going to be affected um, in that interim period. So there's an urgency from the perspective of what I see every day. And I know that didn't directly answer your question, but it was something that, that I feel is necessary to say. Well, we are seeing, you know, sort of a debate in politics right now as to if this bill should be included in the budget or a later bill after April 1st. Do you see it as a similarly urgent issue, Senator? In general, I am a fan of, of legislating through the legislature. I believe that policy matters of importance should be passed outside of the budget. But something that, that has the potential for controversy, it also has a fiscal impact as well. I don't see why it couldn't be in the budget. Again, that 99% of the things I would like to see pass outside of the budget, and just because I think as legislature we should be doing that. But this is an issue that I, that I would not mind having, having in the budget. Again, multiple conversations have to continue to, to be ongoing. Um, three branches of, of government, the, the executive and the, and the assembly and the, and, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Senate, we have to continue to have conversations about how we can move this forward and, and, and whether it's going to be part of the budget or a standalone outside of the budget and, and when that timing would be. And we're going to take a quick break right now, but we'll be right back with more on the impact of legal weed. Stay with us. We're back with our discussion on the legalization of recreational marijuana. Now, Eli, I want to talk to you a bit more about the collateral damage you see in the enforcement of marijuana laws. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think I mentioned uh, a number of the things already. The Bronx Defenders is a holistic defense organization, so we don't just represent people in criminal cases. We represent people in family court, in immigration proceedings, civil court, when, when they have housing issues. Um, and, and when they're just dealing with mental illness or addiction issues, too. Um, the, the drug is still illegal on a federal level. So that, that leads to a number of implications. And immigration, I think, is a, a real major implication. And that's why it's important to get the, the legislation right in New York in order to avoid some of these consequences. Um, if you have a conviction for marijuana and you're not a citizen, you can be deported. And people are being deported for a single marijuana conviction. People who have lived here for almost their entire lives um, who are not citizens. There's a way to uh, execute sealing that will enable those people to not face those consequences. And that's something that the legislature can do or the, the, the bill can do. It can allow those to be vacated in a way that 
uh, they can no longer be used in immigration proceedings. So while we're, you know, New York is not deciding to deport these people, New York does have the ability to vacate some of these convictions in, in that way. And in fact, district attorney's offices have a way of doing this. And they've done this in the Brooklyn and also in Manhattan. Uh, the district attorney's offices there have set up events where marijuana convictions, past convictions for small amounts of marijuana, have been vacated. We haven't mm -hmm. done that yet in the Bronx. We haven't seen that in the Bronx. And we don't really have to wait for the legislature to act in order to do that. We could do that tomorrow. So there are other, there are other options, but obviously it would be ideal if, if it came through in the law. Um, family court, it's still, you know, marijuana is, is, has prevented, as I think I mentioned earlier, prevented children from being placed with family members because of past marijuana convictions. Um, housing, people are denied the right to, to housing, or uh, there is a right to housing in New York State, but they're denied housing in certain places because of one prior marijuana conviction. Um, student loans, um, and just criminal collateral consequences, just your basic criminal collateral consequences. If somebody gets arrested for possession of marijuana, they go and they get brought to central booking, and they go through lockup, they might spend 24 hours in jail, bail might get set, people spend time on Rikers Island, they lose their job, you know, their relationships are frayed, and it's, and they're in an inhumane space for, you know, for something that, that minor. So it's, it's still happening. It's, it's happening now. And I think that a lot of, some people don't see it because it doesn't affect their community at all. But our clients see it and our clients are affected by it. And to amplify on the point that you just made, what specifically, what key points do you think the legislation should include? Right, so sealing and expungement, but automatic sealing and expungement. So it, not, it doesn't require somebody to go and apply for that because we know that's, you know, people, it, people are not going to be captured by that. If they have to take that, a, a couple extra additional steps to go apply, they don't, a lot of people don't even know that they have marijuana convictions because they happened so long ago or they thought it was a ticket. So sealing and expungement, that's automatic, number one. Number two, investment in communities. The money should come back to the communities that have been targeted, and the community should decide what happens with that money. And the number three, equity, opportunity, as the senator talked about, for people in that community to benefit, to be a part of the new economy. Those are the really restorative, necessary pieces. And then I would just say that one thing in the governor's proposal is he actually increases criminal penalties for marijuana while making it legal. So right now it's a misdemeanor to sell a small amount of marijuana um, to somebody who's over the age of 18. Under the governor's proposal, the age gets raised to 21, and it becomes a Class D felony to transfer a small amount of marijuana to somebody under the age of 21. So somebody on this campus, two 20-year-olds 20 passing a joint between each other are guilty of a Class D felony. That's in the legalization regime. Right now, that's not a felony. So if we're going to legalize it, we shouldn't be increasing criminal penalties uh, for it. So I think that's something that we need to keep in mind, too. Do you have anything to say about that, Senator? Well, increasing criminal penalties is something that I am uh, staunchly against as the chair of the Codes Committee. I, I, I try. We don't want to, I, I am not looking to create any new criminals in the state of New York. Uh, I think that the penal law is, is, is fine the way it is. I, I think that as on a case-by-case -case basis, if we need to expand protection to certain victims of certain crimes, we are a legislature that does protect victims. But at the end of the day, people who are smoking marijuana, we have to look at context. And, and, and who are passing marijuana, as Mr. Northwood mentioned, I, I don't know if those folks should be considered to be felons. And actually, I'm certain that they should not be considered to be felons. And, and right now, that would be a misdemeanor. And that speaks, speaking to the immigration things, like in New York State, there, there, there is a, there's a, a now, there's now a push to, towards one day less, trying to change the, the amount of misdemeanors from 365 days to 364 days because we're having so many issues and concerns with deportation proceedings on misdemeanors. And those misdemeanors include marijuana possession. We, we have to make sure that we're doing things the right way and, and, and not increasing penalties as I can just ditto what he said, putting the money back into the affected communities, making sure that people have a chance to take a part in, in a multi-million or billion dollar industry that we are just consumers in. You, people can no longer just do business in our communities. You must do business with our communities. Doctor, it, it, uh, I just want to make a point. Yeah. Because uh, 
it makes it sound as though the police are deploying people for the purpose of marijuana. They're not deploying people for the purpose of marijuana. Marijuana arrests are a byproduct of neighborhoods that need policing. And uh, I think we should, we, we've got to sort of balance this marriage between uh, disparity and, and racially motivated arrest and, and, uh, and neighborhoods that need policing. Um, I have never seen a police department or anybody in the police department go into a community for the sheer purpose of making marijuana arrests. They just happen to be there, and that's the law. So they're going to enforce the law while they're there. But they're there for the, for the gangs. They're there for uh, um, the heavier crimes, the, the street crimes. They're there to save people. Uh, the, the neighborhood you talk about in the Bronx, where would you say they are? Well, I think this, the South Bronx is mm -hmm. one of the most targeted areas. And I just want to, I, I don't think that necessarily police are there to make marijuana arrests, but police use discretion all the time. Yes, on they the street. do. And so, and in fact, they've, they've created policies now where they no longer are making arrests for many marijuana offenses. Still for certain mm -hmm. ones, but they have a policy now that they're not going to do it for many. They're going to issue summons. So they clearly have the power. The arrests have gone down astronomically in the last few years. They clearly have the power to not make those arrests. Yeah. So police in certain communities that need policing, that's, that's one thing. I think it makes good sense to focus on the crimes that need focusing on and to maybe not focus on, on these things that we've acknowledged are doing more harm than good. So it's, it's more about what you're choosing to enforce. What we as a society want to enforce, um, I think there's no, there's no doubt that the reason that those arrests are higher is because there's more police in these certain communities. I think mm -hmm. you're, you're exactly right about that. Do we need to waste resources? I would say waste resources enforcing laws that are not helping society and in many ways are, are actually hurting a number of people, um, could we focus more on, on different areas? And so, you know, while you might see marijuana, don't make an arrest for that. Issue a summons or, or let it go and focus on the, the, real, the, the real things that, that have brought you to that neighborhood. Well, I'll give you an example. And uh, I hope the statute of limitations has run out on this <laughs> example. <laughs> But I can remember what I would do when I was working. And this is with heroin. This wasn't marijuana. If you were selling it on the corner, then, and I caught you, and you had just a little tiny bit, well, you could buy your freedom by giving me somebody who sold it to you. And that person could buy his freedom by giving me somebody bigger than he is. So the idea is even when you talk about marijuana, Maybe I'm going to stop you, and maybe I'm going to talk to you, and maybe I want to find out who shot somebody. And maybe this is the impetus you need to give me that information. So, you know, there's so many uh, different facets of police work and how it gets accomplished. Uh, so I know what you do is, is very complicated. I definitely know what you do is very complicated, and it takes a lot of thinking. Um, but every one of these, these positions may have some downsides to them in order to do something better or bigger. And uh, so that's why I still have this problem every time we marry uh, recreational marijuana and, uh, and race race the disparities. I, I have a problem with that. It would be great if they weren't married. It would be great if they were divorced. Yeah, and for all of you, what do you think the biggest takeaway for, is from this discussion of legalizing recreational marijuana? I'll defer to the doctor. Um, so it's happening. You know, the train has left the station. Uh, and I think, so the question is not whether to go forward, but it, how to go forward. And to be thoughtful, making sure that we're educating uh, communities, right? That we're um, uh, that we have policies in place so that we know exactly what the cannabis products are from a health, public health perspective. Um, to be able to fund the research, also that can guide the policies as well. Yeah. Well, I definitely agree with that. Uh, the idea is there, and it's on the table. It's, it has to be discussed, 
and definitely when it comes to immigration and low-level crimes and, and disrupting families and, and things like that. Uh, but it's how you put it together. It's how it's thought out, how it's presented. Uh, that to me is the, is, is the whole key to this, is how you put it together. Money coming back into the communities, it's a great idea. Um, but I haven't heard that yet. And I'm waiting to hear those things. And uh, I'll just wait and see. Um, well, I'm going to say something that Joe may not agree with here, but I, I, it's something that I've, I've seen and I believe to be true, which is that I don't really think marijuana enforcement is about marijuana. I think it's, um, along with other low-level crime enforcement, it's a, a means of social control and surveillance in certain communities. And I really feel like I'm hopeful that this conversation, the conversation about marijuana, the debates about marijuana, will allow us to speak more about how that's happening on a larger scale in the criminal legal system. Because marijuana is just kind of a window into all of these other issues. When we're talking about low-level offenses um, where people of certain races and people in certain communities are targeted. So I'm hopeful that this actually leads to a bigger conversation about that and showing that when we stop making arrests for marijuana, crime doesn't go down. You know, when we stop making arrests, it, it's, it, the, the sky doesn't fall. I think that could translate in, into other areas as well. And I also just want to impress a sense of urgency. Um, as the doctor said, this is, it's going to happen. And, it, and for the harm that it's doing, um, it should stop, we should stop that now. And we have the ability to, and I hope that it happens. I hope that it happens before April 1st. I hope that it happens tomorrow. Um, but I hope, I think it's essential that it happens the right way. And I think that the bills in the legislature are the bills to support. And I hope that the governor comes to those because I think that what the senator has done, what Senator Kruger has done, um, and Ms. People Stokes also, I think that they understand the issues. And, and unfortunately, that's all oh, the time we have for this special collaboration between public <laughs> radio station WFUV, <laughs> the Norwood News, and BronxNet Television, focusing on recreational marijuana legalization. We want to thank all of our guests today, Jamal Bailey, Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, Joseph Thompson, and Eli Northrup. I'm, uh, I'm Julia Rist. <laughs> and I'm Teresa Schleep. Thanks for being with us.